Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 4. We're going to get into a message here shortly from there. And I uh, sure do appreciate those that have been working in and around the church. A lot is getting done lately, and the real st tough stuff right now. And I appreciate Jim Evans and Frank Broughton and Russ Lape painting up the baseboards and getting them in all these cuts and angles and things like that. That kind of adds that nice little touch, you know. That's some of you that are homeowners, you know, when you get to that part, man, that's the. That's the tough stuff is the window trims and the baseboards and everything. It just, I don't know, I love that stuff, and I notice it everywhere I go. And, and, uh, but thank you, and other people are doing other things around the building and landscaping and stuff. And hope we're going to have a good time tonight in the Lord with Mike Myers, the missionary to Mexico, and then Vacation Bible School. That's so important uh, to put that net in the water and try to catch some children for Christ and draw the net and see if they'll come to the Lord. We got Joe Kaiser coming this year and uh, you will never forget him after he's here. It's just how it is. He's a, just a tremendous dynamic uh, children's evangelist and he is just Mr. Excitement and uh, uh, I'm honored that he's able to be with us and we're going to build Vacation Bible School around the Lord and around his servant, Brother Joe. And uh, the kids, he's like, a, I call him a kid magnet everywhere he goes. You know, I see him at the, the summit in Berlin, uh, New Jersey. And, and uh, the last day, the kids always come up and sing. And he's got five, 600 kids up there singing their lungs out, that, singing songs that he taught them th that week. And it's just a wonderful thing to see. You're going to love him. And we're going to want to put our all into this. And we're going to want to put prayer and fasting and transportation, all those things. We're going to need a lot of people. So... That's tonight at 7.30. Mark chapter 4 is the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. Jesus is teaching. It's also found in Matthew 13 and Luke 8. But we're going to look at the account in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus is teaching. And the title of this message is, Which of These Statements is Yours? Which of these statements is yours? In this parable, Jesus is going to describe four different responses to the gospel and to the ministry of the word. These responses, I'm going to try to kind of interpret into maybe four kind of modern day uh, statements. And one of these statements represents every one of us here uh, in this room. This is a wonderful parable to be familiar with. It is not only a parable, it is a prophecy. Jesus can do that. He's so amazing. He can teach a parable that's also a prophecy. Jesus taught for three years in his public ministry after he was about 30 years of age. He was baptized and then he went through the uh, time of temptation on the Mount of Temptation and then uh, he began to gather men around him, and we can read about his public ministry by counting the Passovers, the Passover feasts. And as he began, a year later there was a Passover feast, and then a year later there was a Passover feast, and then a year later the last Passover feast in which he was the Passover lamb and died that day upon the cross for our sins. So we know for a fact that he had three years of public ministry. Now, if you've ever studied through the life of Christ, which I've done and I've enjoyed uh, writing notes about that, the first year of his public ministry with the men that he had gathered around him, he did all the ministry. Uh, he gave the messages, the ministering, and uh, uh, met people's needs and everything for the first year. The second year, he sent them out two by two. And not only did he send the 12 apostles out, but also 70 others, elders, two by two. And he also went out. And then the third year, everyone out. And so the second year and the third year, everybody was involved uh, in ministry. And what they did was they made a circuit around a region called Galilee in the north of Palestine, where they went to every city and to every town preaching Christ, and of course they had apostolic gifts and signs and miracles and wonders 
you know, raising the dead and healing the lepers and the blind and the sick and all that, that type of thing. It was just amazing times on earth. But before he sent them out, he taught this parable. And this parable would help them understand the responses that they were going to receive as they went out and shared the gospel with people and preached the word. And these responses are seen out in the world by those that are lost as well as in the church. And I think by the end of this message you will understand that. But Jesus prepared them and Jesus basically said, now listen, when you, when you go out and you sow the seed of the word of God, you're going to get these four responses. And so it's kind of neat, before the church ever began ministry, the Lord said, this is what's going to happen. Now, why did he say that? I think so we would not be discouraged. And now here we are in 2018, and any of you that are soul winners, or any of you that are trying to minister the word of God in any capacity in the church or in the, in the community or something, I don't care if you go to nursing homes, prisons, where you go, um, any of you that have been faithfully working in the ministry know that you personally have seen these four responses to the gospel. And so as we go through them, as some of you get involved in ministry, please understand that, that it's not you. If they reject the gospel, it's not you. If they only last for a very short time, it's not you. A lot of times we can feel pretty, uh, some of you have given up. You, you don't even go soul winning anymore. You used to uh, because of these things. Yet the Lord taught this. And here we are, 2018, and it's the same as he said. That's why I say this is not only a parable, but this is a prophecy about human behavior and their response to the gospel. And he compares our ministry of sowing the word of God, sharing the gospel with people, preaching, teaching, Whatever we're doing, counseling, mentoring, he compares it all with a farmer or what's called a sower going forth to sow. Now, when we're talking about sowing, we're not talking about needle and thread and somebody sowing. It's S-O-W-E-R. We're talking about a farmer. In the old days, they used to broadcast or they used to spread the seed by hand around the soil that they had prepared uh, for their, their, their garden or their harvest, whatever. And Jesus uses that illustration from life and makes a spiritual and a heavenly application, which is called a parable. Now, another reason why this parable is unique is not only is it a parable, but a prophecy, but it is also unique in that it is only one of two parables that Jesus ever interpreted for us. In the Gospels, you will read at least 31, some say 37, depending on how you want to interpret it, 37, 31 parables Jesus taught, but he only interpreted two of them. In other words, he only said the parable and then said, this is what I mean by it, in two cases. One is the parable of the wheat and the tares, which we're not looking at this morning, and the other is the parable of the sower. And so let's get into this here, and let's see this, and I'm going to make four statements based on these four responses to the ministry of the Word of God in people's lives, and these statements are going to help prepare you when you go out so you won't be discouraged, but they're also going to describe you, everybody in this room, one of these statements describes you. In verse 4, he says this, well, verse 3, hearken, behold, there went out a sower, to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And uh, we're trying a new carpet here, and I guess it's not going to work. <clears throat> there. And it came to pass as he sowed that some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Now, a little later, when they were alone in verse 10, uh, they, they came to him and they said, what in the world are you talking about? And so that statement about some seed falling by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured up. You can see that even to this day. Any of you that have ever been farmers or any of you that have ever observed farming, and you can do that today in western New York because there's so much 
farming, there's so much planting going on right now, you see a tractor uh, out in the field plowing, disking, cully packing, whatever, planting, I'll guarantee you, you'll see birds around. I'll guarantee you that. And they're having the time of their life right now as they go and devour the seeds that are being worked up by the farmers as they try to prepare the soil. But these fowls, it tells us in verse 15, he says, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm taking something that every one of you has observed, farmers, and I want to make a spiritual application. The sower soweth the word. They sow corn seed, bean seed, whatever. We're sowing the word of God. And then he tells us what that means by those by the wayside. And these are they, verse 15, by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. Just like the birds come immediately behind the tractor. I mean, they'll walk right behind you and they take the seed. Now, when we used to plant corn or beans or something, I don't know if any of you are farmers or some of you will, but you remember the corn seed that we planted was, was pink in color. The reason it was pink in color is because it was completely smothered by poison. The pink is poison so that the birds won't eat it. And the bean seeds are purple and, uh, because they're covered in poison so the birds wouldn't eat it. I mean, we wised up that much. Uh, but I'll tell you what, if you're out there farming, you're out there with birds. Birds are right behind you, ready to pick up the seed. And this is a picture of how Satan comes immediately and steals the seed that has been sown in people's hearts. Now, in Luke's account, don't turn there, but Luke 8, 12, he adds these words, lest they believe and be saved. Lest they believe and they be saved. So we preach the word of God, we share the gospel, and, and sometimes a person's just not ready to maybe pray and believe and trust Christ like we talked about last week when we talked about the Roman road and, and you got to leave the seed in their hearts and you hope and pray the seed stays there. And sometimes it does. Sometimes it stays lodged in a person's heart for 10, 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden the light comes out and they remember something somebody said 30 years ago and they, they, they act upon it. Sometimes that happens. But sometimes Satan comes immediately and steals the seed of the word of God. Now, you know, that happens in the unsaved. And I can prove that it happens to us today, the saved. I can remember in Farnham when we were out there in the school building, we were having revival meetings, and evangelist Larry Clayton was with us. Some of you remember when he used to come with his whole family. And boy, what times we had back then. My, oh, my. I remember he was preaching on a Sunday morning, and we had him in, and he preached. And, and uh, I thought the morning was just glorious, uh, the things that God did and and I had him in my car, and I was rejoicing, and we were going back to my house, I believe it is, so we could uh, have dinner with him. And, and I looked over at Larry Clayton, the old evangelist, and I thought he was old then. But boy, he's up there in years now, but he's still going faithfully. And I remember looking over at him in his car, and tears were streaming down his face. Tears were just streaming down his face, and he didn't look happy. Well, they weren't tears of joy. I said, Brother Clayton, are you all right? Is everything Okay. And he said this to me, I'll never forget this. In fact, I've kind of repeated this sometimes in ways I'll never forget what he says. He says, he says Brother Cole, he says, by 2 o'clock this afternoon, almost everybody who listened to what I said this morning will have forgotten what I said. And forgotten forever. Many times in our church on a Sunday night, I will ask about the Sunday morning sermon. And very few people will remember by Sunday night what I had preached Sunday morning. See, it's not only with the lost, but with the saved that the devil comes and steals the word out of our hearts. That's what he does. He's a thief. Jesus says he's a thief. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And even in churches by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Football. Football's on. NASCAR's on. Important stuff. We got lawns to mow and, 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 and things to do, and we, we forget. And, and, and in our pride, our pride 
You know you're proud if you're constantly forgetting sermons and uh, thinking they're not uh, for you. We don't want to be like that. We want to be humble. The, the wayside, uh, the wayside uh, hearers, these are the lost. These are those that hear the word and never get saved. And I think of King Agrippa one time as the Apostle Paul was sharing the word of God with King Agrippa. And he said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am. He said, I wish you were all saved. And Agrippa was a, was a hearer that I believe Satan came and stole the seed from his heart as he listened to Paul. And he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. A couple of chapters ahead in Acts chapter 25 and verse number 22, it says, And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them. And uh, verse 23, he commanded a centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberty, and uh, that he should forbid none of his acquaintances. And then it says, After a certain few days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. The scripture says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We are taught in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We need to try to persuade people to be saved. Compel them to come in that God's house may be full. And sometimes as we're sowing the seed of the word of God and having glorious opportunities to witness, we'll come across people like Agrippa and people like Felix who will say, at a more convenient time, some other time. That's my first statement, some other time. Some other time. The next opportunity I get, does that statement represent you? Sometimes people have heard the word of God over and over and over again. They say, some other time, next time, next time. And I'm not just talking about the lost. Try to apply some of this to the saved. Good sermon, good truth today, but I'm not quite ready for it. Some other time or the next opportunity I get, I'm going to yield or submit to that truth that God has shown me. These are the lost. And then we see the stony ground. In verses 5 and 6, we read about a second response to the ministry of the word of God, and that is the seed that falls on stony ground. And some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. The disciples again ask, what, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? And he interprets verses 5 and 6 and verses 16 and 17. And he says this, And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Man, it's the best thing they ever heard in their lives. And have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are, the, they are offended. We see, number one, the lost. Now we see, number two, the offended. The offended. Now, these receive the word of God with gladness. I mean, it's like the greatest thing they've ever heard in their life. I believe they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I think if I could use a statement to describe these types of hearers, it would be this. I didn't sign up for this. 
I didn't sign up for this. What? What we see here in verse 17, affliction and persecution for the word's sake. Affliction and persecution ariseth for the word's sake. You mark my words today, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, with that package comes affliction and persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, what's the difference between affliction and persecution? Generally speaking, this is very general, but generally speaking, affliction is when the devil gets all over you. Persecution is when people get all over you. For the word's sake. Sometimes I've seen people get saved. Trust Christ as their savior. And you, you're trying to mentor them and guide them to the next step. And you say, well, now you need to be baptized by immersion. You need to follow our Lord and believers' baptism. And they go home and discuss it with family or parents. And, and they say, go tell that pastor you've already been baptized. And by further investigation, they had a little bit of water sprinkled on their head when they were an infant baby. Or they had a little bit of water poured on their head when they were an infant baby and they, they received the baptismal certificate from that religion saying that they had been born into the kingdom of God. That's all a lie. That's not scriptural. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says you believe first and then you're baptized and there's only one mode of baptism that is biblical. And that is by immersion. For only immersion in deep water can show the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that new believer in Christ, oftentimes because of <coughs> hostility, and that's what the word persecution means. A synonym for persecution is hostility. They begin to get hostility, and, and oftentimes it comes from family members. They want to know what just happened to you. Did you join a cult? How did they, how did they brainwash you so quickly? And they do not understand the glorious conversion of, of regeneration when you're born again and you're a new creature in Jesus Christ and, and pretty soon family and, and maybe people at work and people in the neighborhood uh, begin to get all over that person as they're a babe in Christ and they're trying to explain what happened to them. And then not only do people get all over them, but the devil gets all over them. Affliction. It says Job was afflicted by the devil and, and he was a righteous man and and so uh, afflictions come to believers and, and, and persecutions come to believers and, and there is no exceptions. There's no exceptions. But this person here, because after they got saved, they never got any roots down. They were shallow. They received the Lord, it says, with gladness, verse 16, but they had no root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while but usually, their endurance is an emotional endurance. It's not a spiritual endurance. And emotions and inspiration can only take you so far and it wears off. And we've got to have some spiritual roots where we, we, we dig down deep and we, we, we drive our roots down deep. And this seed is said to be scorched. When the heat's put on, it's scorched. And they finally put up the white flag and they say, I didn't sign up for this. And off they go. And you don't see them and you hear you are the puzzled soul winner saying, boy, I thought they really got saved. Or boy, they were attending my boys class or my girls class and it seemed like they were grown. And then the heat was put on by the devil or by people. It happens to everyone. Because they had no root. They had no root. I'm a pretty good gardener. If there's one thing I know, you got to prepare the soil. I grew up on a farm. It was forced on me. <laughs> but when I go around and plant the plants around my house, I have worked up that soil. I've added vermiculite, peat moss, whatever I can, in good soil, it's loose, and I put the roots of those plants down deep. And I hardly ever lose a plant around our house. 
because the roots are down deep. I didn't sign up for this. The first statement, some other time. Next opportunity I'll get. Next time somebody preaches on prayer, I'm going to be a prayer warrior. Some other time. The second one is I didn't sign up for this. I didn't know my family was going to turn against me. I didn't know those at work were going to turn against me in the neighborhood. And, and by the way, you're going to get it from church members too. Yeah, church members are going to get on you and say, aren't you getting a little carried away with this stuff? You'd be surprised. The persecution, the hostility. Colossians 2, 6 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him rooted and built up him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, I'm not yelling at you. I'm just telling you, get rooted. Get rooted in, in Jesus Christ. Drive your roots down deep because the, the heat's coming. The, the sun's coming up. It's going to get hot and you're going to get scorched. And this one withered away. They are the offended. They're the offended. Imagine if everybody that had ever been offended in this day and age was still in church. We would be saying, folks, we've got to build a bigger church building somewhere. We don't have room for everybody. Got offended. Did you ever see the people that got offended by such little things? It's because they have no root. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Psalm 119, verse 165. Well, you get rooted. You love this book. Nothing's going to offend you. Somebody says you're ugly. You say, yeah, I'm ugly. In fact, the Bible says worse of me than that I'm ugly. The Bible says my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Not, not the bad stuff, the good stuff. Is that Phil's right? You're, I, I'm ugly. That doesn't offend me. You can't offend a person who loves the Bible. John 16, 1, Jesus said, These things have I written unto ye that you be not offended. The person that loves the Bible, they're not offended by preaching. I got to hurry. Number three is thorny ground. It says in verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. What did he mean? Verse 18, he interprets. He says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, which hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. This is a believer, too. I believe they receive Christ as their Savior, but, but they're just too busy. And, and sincerely, the third statement is this, I, I'm busy. And there are a lot of people who are good people, good church members, but they're just so busy, they're unfruitful spiritually. Because certain things have choked the word of God, like the cares of this world. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs that the more things you accumulate on this earth, the more time you're going to have to spend maintaining them. And you're going to spend so much time maintaining the things of this world that you will be spiritually unfruitful. And you'll say, well, I've got to take care of what God gave me. And we accumulate. I mean, in America, you go by a Christian's garage with the doors open. It's no different than their neighbor's garage. It's filled with everything except cars. Paul talked about his lifestyle of simplicity and sincerity. 2 Corinthians 1.12. He hardly owned anything. So he could give himself completely to the ministry of the word of God. And boy, what a fruitful life he lived. But the cares of this world, it says, and then the deceitfulness of riches. You know, God bless you, but sometimes I hear people say, well, money doesn't grow on trees. You know, God doesn't pay the bills. And... Uh, you know, you hear comments like that. Well, yeah, you know, I've got, to, I've got to make more money. I'm going to continue this standard of living that, 
We want, my wife wants, like, we got to make more, so I got to work two jobs. She's got to work two jobs. Who knows who's raising the kids anymore? Everybody's out working. The deceitfulness original. Let me tell you something for the record. God does pay the bills. God does pay the bills his way. And I remember when we started out 38 years ago, almost 39 years ago in marriage, we decided my wife's staying home, going to raise the children. I'm going to work. And, and, and the, the Bible says, you know, she should be a keeper at home. And, and we're going to take that literally to be true. Maybe you don't, but we do. And we took that literally to be true. And, and we're going to make it on one income. And God has never failed us. He's never failed us. Because he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He says, you put me first, I'll take care of you. God does pay the bills. But there's so many that don't know that. Maybe they just haven't grown their faith yet. To, to be able to incorporate that. And I, I feel for them. I hope their faith grows till someday they incorporate that into their lifestyle. That God is good and God is great. And God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. It says the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and lusts of other things. Oh my, you know, when you got saved, you weren't delivered from your flesh. I still have red blood going through my veins and believers in Christ have problems with lusts. And lust will produce an unfruitful Christian. It's, it's a battle. I understand it. It's a battle. But they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. And if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. But boy, lust will make us unfruitful. And there's believers in Christ struggling with pornography, drugs, alcohol, all kinds of lusts. Self, the lust for self, and, and they're being unfruitful. The third person is just too busy. I'm busy. And they're, 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 they're sincerely, they sincerely are busy. They don't have time for the things of the Lord. But then there's the last one. And this is the good ground. Number one is the lost. Number two is the offended. Number three is the worldly. The cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. Lusts. I mean, you look in this parable and you'll see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life if you look at this parable. He's trying to help us. He's trying to say, body of Christ, these are the things that are going to keep you from being unfruitful, but I, I can help you. But then we have the good ground. Praise the Lord for the, the grounded Number five, and this, this is the person who says this. This is the statement they live by. I'm in all the way. I'm in all the way. The first person says, some other time. Next opportunity I have to hear about the gospel or that spiritual truth, I, I'm going to get with it. Next time, next time, next time, next time I'm going to get with it. Next time. This year is going to be different. 2018, the next time. That's the lost then there's the offended. And that's the person who says, I, I didn't sign up for this. They didn't tell me when I got saved I was going to have affliction and persecution. And then there's the, the busy, the worldly. I, I'm just busy. I, I wish I could do more for God, but I got so much that occupies my time. Praise the Lord for the grounded. I'm in all the way. And Jesus said this, falls upon good ground and bears fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Everybody different, but they bear some fruit. They bear some fruit. I got a kick out of that. I don't know, where's Eva? Eva here, that was funny the other day. You didn't see it, did you? The Jenny, no? Yeah, that was funny. I didn't know how to respond. That was wonderful. I got out of my car at my house the other day, and this girl starts running across the street at me. And I didn't know who she was, young lady. You didn't see this part. She comes running up to me and gives me a big hug. I, I, I honestly had never seen this girl before in my life. <laughs> and I'm thinking, boy, I got brand new neighbors. 
just moved in from Ohio over here, and my wife's inside the house. And here's this young lady giving me this big hug, and she's starting to cry. And she says, you're Pastor Cole, right? I said, yes, I, I wasn't dressed like this. And she said, you know, I had faith in God all my life, but you helped me to have faith in Christ. Turns out she went to Tristan Walsh's funeral. And all I did was share the gospel with everybody there and tried to draw the net like we talked about last week and said, this is how you receive Christ as your Savior. I'm glad for a little bit of fruit. I don't know, 100-fold, 60-fold, 30. I don't know where I am, but I'm glad. I'm glad. We had a lady in church last week that uh, a partner and I went to her place over a year ago and shared the Roman road with her, and she trusted Christ as her Savior. And uh, fruitful. God wants you to be fruitful. He has ordained you that you might bring forth fruit. Many of you are, are living a fruitful life. You've entered into that. You've, there was a time in your life where you said, I'm in all the way. I'm in all the way. And Jesus went on to say one time, he said, you know, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth fruit. And that old corn of wheat, I can remember one time my dad found a bag of corn that had been laying in our barn for 20 years. Did you ever see corn in bags? It looks like it's dead. You ever seen, you never, any of you ever seen corn you plant on the farm in bags or something? Just a few of you, man, I wish. It looks like it's dead. It's just this hard, tiny, dinky, shriveled up thing. It's been in a bag for 20 years. So dad put it in the corn drill, went out and said, let's see what happens. Planted rows and rows and rows of corn with that bag, and guess what happened? It all came up. See, you, you could be here today, and God saved you 20 years ago, but you haven't borne any fruit. You're dead. But if a corn of wheat die, you take that corn of wheat, and that corn of wheat dies, and you plant it in the ground, it brings forth fruit. And that thing would from that tiny little seed would come out a corn stalk. And sometimes those corn stalks would have three ears of corn on them, and every ear would have about 700 kernels on it. And because one seed died, you ended up with about 2,000 kernels. And Jesus is teaching us that if you die, you die to self and you say, that's it, I'm in all the way, you'll bring forth fruit. We talked about Sam Jones earlier. 500,000 people, it said, came to know Christ as their Savior after he gave his life to the Lord. Because of one man gave his life to the Lord. Some people say that besides D.L. Moody, he was probably the most prolific evangelist that has ever crossed our country. I don't know. Only God knows those things, amen? But some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty, but everybody who dies to self bears some fruit that remains to the glory of God. But the statement that has to represent you is this, I'm in all the way. I'm in all the way. I remember a missions conference in 1979 in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I just Heard a preacher preach, and, and that was it. I took my hands off my life, and I said, God, I'm yours. I'm in all the way. And since then, I've had some fruit, some fruit. They that be planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of the Lord. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. But you got to get planted. You got to get planted. You got to die. You got to say, that's it. I'm tired of this fruitless life. I'm dying to self, giving my life to Christ. And you bear fruit. I'd like us to bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Father, I've tried to be faithful to the text. But Lord, I think these people you talked about when you walked on the earth could be Represented by four statements, some here today are saying some other time, 
some other opportunity maybe to dedicate my life to the Lord, I'm going to do it. I mean it. I'm going to do it. Or some other time I'm going to get saved. Others perhaps are saying, I didn't sign up for this. I don't want this affliction and persecution for a living for the Lord. I, I, I didn't sign up for it. And they wither away and they just say, I, I'm just, I'm just going to be at a distance. Others, Lord, say, I'm busy. And they're sincere. They are busy. And sometimes they're busy about very good things. But it's the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in choke the word. And then, Lord, thank you for those that say, I'm in all the way. Thank you for them. Help us all to get there. I wasn't there for a long time. And just thank you for bringing me to the good soil getting rooted and grounded in Christ and in the church and thank you for that as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we have a song starting an invitation perhaps today the good Lord spoke to you I tried to build this message on last week's about soul winning but these are the responses you're going to get when you try to win souls but there are also the responses in church of believers to the word of God only the Lord could tell a parable that has different applications what a great teacher he was how he ought to be worshipped as God has been speaking maybe to your heart today you'd like to come and pray about that decision won't you come maybe there's somebody here today and this is the day I'm in all the way I'm in all the way I mean it God here I am if you'll stand to your feet step out to the aisle some have come already you can join them in prayer nobody's going to bother you just between you and the Lord, why don't you come and pray? Which of these statements, everyone in this room is saying four things in your heart, either some other time, I didn't sign up for this, I'm offended, I'm busy, I'm worldly, or I'm in all the way, I'm grounded, I'm on the good ground, I want to bear fruit, I want to die to self bear as much fruit for the Lord as I possibly can. Won't you come and pray today if you need to be saved? My, oh my. I don't know what else to say. If you're a man or you're a woman today and you need to be saved and you're from this church, I don't care if you're from out of state. The Holy Spirit's been talking to you. I promise you in most cases by two o'clock this afternoon you'll have forgotten everything. So why not respond now? What God is speaking to your heart. Won't you come? And let somebody, if you're a lady, we'll have a lady. If you're a man, we'll have a man. Show you just a few verses of promise from the Bible. Have prayer with you. Maybe lead you in prayer to trust Christ as your Savior today. Is that anybody? Say, Pastor, I need that, but I just, I'm just too afraid to come. I understand that because I was in your seat once. But could you at least raise your hand? I promise I won't approach you. I won't bother you or anything. I just want to pray for you in closing. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I, I don't know for sure. If I died today, I don't know for sure if I'd go to heaven. If it's possible for a person to know that, I would like to know that. Could I pray for you if you'd like to be saved? Raise your hand right up and take it down. And let me see your hand. I want to pray for you in closing. Father, I don't know where we're at today spiritually, Lord, but uh, it's one of these four and none else. And Lord, I just want to pray you'd help us, God, to get in that good ground, away from the wayside and away from the sun that scorches and the thorns that choke, where we get down deep and our roots can go down, get the water and the food and we can grow up and bear fruit, some hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Lord, I'm concerned there's some here that haven't borne any fruit in a long time. They used to. They used to be very fruitful, very aggressive, very on fire. Something happened, Lord. Something happened. Lord, I pray you'd speak to their conscience, their heart, that we would be a yielded people. I pray for these young people. To remember the words of C.T. Studd who said, One life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh God, help us. Revive somebody, we pray. 
this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Not only do we forget the word, we forget the announcement.